Warning, this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who have roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. One love, two friends, and an uncountable number of smoked joints. Tonight we will take a look at an often overlooked subculture within Liberty City's dark criminal alleyways. We will follow what little we were able to confirm about the lives of Liberty City's most notorious Rastafarians. We will see friendships bloom, blood bonds tested, and a lot of drugs delivered and consumed. Join me as we uncover the stories hidden within the thick layer of smoke which covers Shotler as we follow the life and times of little Jacob Hughes and his mentor, Tafor Maxwell Davies, better well known as Real Batman. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks, many of which are extended versions of the tracks that are on streaming services. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Diecastinator, Chuck K45, and Miles Garrett. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I truly can't express my gratitude for fully. Thank you so much. Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Diecastinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come soon. Mason Collin's podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment and fixing it up and then starting a new farm from scratch, and Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things Diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models, and much more with new videos basically every day in addition to buying and selling and trading the Diecast cars. All links in the description, and a very big thank you to all of my patrons. Your support is literally helping me to keep the lights on, so from the bottom of my little black heart, thank you all so very much. Support the channel by showing my executive producers some love, or sign up yourself today. And now, back to the video. Regular viewers will already be well aware of the fact that we are only able to cover what we know or strongly suspect to be true about the many criminals and criminal adjacent people that we've looked into on this program. Because of this, learning about the early lives for some of our subjects can be particularly difficult, especially to confirm things without a shadow of a doubt. This is very much the case for our subjects tonight, though we will be primarily focusing on little Jacob, as we definitely know more information on him in comparison to his mentor. One thing we do know though is that both Jacob and Badman were born in Jamaica, Jacob circa 1982, and Badman a year earlier in 81. Like many of their fellow Jamaicans, both Jacob and Badman would be raised in the Rastafarian tradition and religion, smoking marijuana regularly, decrying the corruption of modern society, and unfortunately eventually becoming involved in gang culture. Jacob and Badman would form their own posse of Yardies while in Jamaica, though they would almost certainly not be called that until their move to America. Speaking of which, by 2001 both Jacob and Badman had immigrated to the United States together, when Jacob would have been 19 and Badman 20. The two would begin living in Broker's Shotler district, where they would begin to establish their yardies as a force to be reckoned with among dope dealers. 
It's unknown exactly when the two actually moved to America, but we do know that they were stateside by 2001, because they would both be arrested for armed robbery that year, as well as in 2002, when Jacob was arrested for burglary, illegal entry with criminal intent, and Badman for sale of a controlled substance, but surprisingly, it was cocaine, not marijuana. The two would continue to build up their presence in East Broker over the next few years without incident, but eventually both be arrested again, likely at the same time, but for different things once again. This time it would be Jacob who would be arrested for possession of marijuana this time, and Badman would be arrested for assault. We speculate because he punched the officers that were arresting Jacob. Though both were Jamaican-born, Jacob would adjust to America better than his mentor. And though they would also both struggle to be understood by most American-born citizens they'd encounter, due to their use of Rastafarian slang, dread talk, or more formally, Ieric, Jacob would once again be more intelligible to the non-Jamaicans they dealt with, and as a result, he would handle the majority of their networking as it were. One of the contacts that Jacob would make for them would be the owner of a cab company in Hove Beach, Roman Bellick, whom he would become good enough friends with to get occasional rides from Roman for his less than legal business meetings. Sometime in 2008, Jacob would also meet for the first time Roman's cousin Nico Bellick, who had recently arrived in Liberty City to live here with his cousin. Having heard many stories from Roman over the years about Nico's experience in war and his overall reliability, Jacob would be instantly trustworthy of the new Bellic cousin when Nico was asked to drive Jacob to a meeting with the Hillside Posse Gangsters, a rival Yardie's set. Jacob would supply Nico with a Glock 17 and 150 rounds of ammunition just in case the deal went south, and unsurprisingly, that's exactly what would happen, when instead of the expected gang member, three Hillside Posse Gangsters arrived to try and eliminate Jacob completely. What's this? I thought there's only gonna be one of you coming. Jacob, 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 we have to teach a bad man his lesson and team. Thanks to Nico's skills with a firearm, both he and Jacob would manage to walk away from the encounter after taking down all three gangsters, and a fourth who attempted to ambush them from a balcony overlooking the alley. Now truly believing everything he'd heard about Nico from Roman, and always in need of assistance for his dangerous line of work, Jacob would begin employing Nico directly to help him, and Batman, maintain control of their territory and their business. Hold on. Uh, it's Nico. Nico? Yeah, me bleach hard last night, you know. The show come, yo. Just hold on. What? Oh, 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 Nico. Hey. Glad to see the man, you know. What to my man, Roman? Roman? Eh. He's okay. Eh. He's still waiting for his big break, eh? Big break? Sure. I promise I'll come for to a food on an acre. A boy for creep before him can walk, you know. Yeah. Anyway, let's go for a little drive. Come. Yet again, Badman and Jacob would attempt to purchase drugs from some of their rivals, despite the rising tensions, and would set up a meeting with the Hillside Posse members at an apartment off of Saratoga Avenue in Willis. However, given how the last meet went, Jacob would employ Nico to cover him just in case things once again didn't pan out. And once again, the deal would indeed be soured when the Hillside Posse gangsters demanded their money with no intention of handing over any product, which they didn't even bring with them. Nico would gun down the gangsters as they attempted to flee the building out the back, and proceed to pick up Jacob and lose the LSPD now pursuing them before dropping Jacob off at the unofficial headquarters for the Yardies, the Homebrew Cafe. Nico would eventually be introduced to Badman himself, though given Badman's increasing paranoia, exacerbated by his excessive use of marijuana, this would make for an encounter that was less than friendly, at least initially. Hey! Hey boy, don't ah, move, don't move! The fuck, don't are you move, boy! How are you? Eh? Oh, where you come from? How are you? Hey man, I'm here to see Jacob. It's Nico. Nico? Badman, what going down there, sir? Some boy I don't saw beat off the door. Some boy I don't saw call himself Nico, say so he wanna see a road boy. Nico? I'm a boy that bad mama. Yo, free up the boy, man, yo. Are you a boy that? Yeah. Sure. Boy that, yo. Come on, you. 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 want to control the taxi. You know, when you have people that knock on people door and thing, you have to be careful and thing. No, it's okay. Yeah, man. See, you tell me. Hey, don't you worry, man. Watch what you're doing, you know. See, you're a boy over there, son. Nico. Go deal with them, see, in there. Oh, I'm Nico. You all right? Hey, no problem. It's good in the introduction as any other. Yeah, me hear that, you know. <laughs> anyway. Some boy around with bad man, you know. I'm gonna ask you a favor. Go on now. Hey, my youth. Some boy them dip on the corner and thing, and the boy them sell some things and thing, and I go on and I say, oh, them don't want to give me my money and thing, and every corner my corner, and I want my money and thing, you know. I know so that I go, go you know, I want to deal with the case proper. You know, see it. All right. Let me explain. 
It's a business thing I go on down there. Right. They are selling weed, but they're not supposed to sell weed. And they're not cutting them in. Okay. So when you go down there and deal with them. See it? Right. It's not going to be cheap. Where do I find them? Cheap? Cheap, my youth. You worry about cheap? We not worry about cheap, you know. The boy, them dip on the corner, I say, the boy, them other things, and I, on my corner, that and thing, and I say, every corner on my corner, and thing, I'm going to write that to the boy, them go on and say, oh, they want to give me my money. Oh, something for go on with that. All right, hear me now. What bad man is saying is, the boy, them are some novice, see? You go find them when you go up on the corner of Alpha and Salt Boat, and see? When you go down and say, you go see, and, and just deal with them, see? Right, you'll find out how them work, all right? I'm all right. All right. No, you want someone to split for you? No, no thanks. Issues. You sure? I'm sure. All right. Respect. My yo, pass me some of that thing we have over there, sir. All right. Yeah. All like it. Jacob would explain to Nico their newest problem, hustlers. The label often put on the loosely affiliated African-American dealers who operated out of neighborhoods like the Firefly Projects and Broker or East and North Holland in Algonquin. A group of hustlers had started to move in on Yardy territory, and it would be Nico's responsibility to follow one of these dealers and take out the whole group at once. Beyond these jobs, Jacob would also semi-regularly employ Nico to pick up stashes of product from the homebrew cafe and deliver them to their customers, usually in and around East Broker. Nico would do at least 10 collections and deliveries like this for Batman and Jacob, but eventually, the heat that primarily Batman was bringing down on the two would become so intense that to continue the high-risk, low-cost exchanges would not be worth it. After working together for several weeks, or perhaps months, it isn't clear, Jacob and Nico would become close friends. Close enough to hang out regularly outside of their work, and to rely on each other should they need assistance, which they often both did, given their tumultuous criminal lifestyles. Through their various conversations, Jacob would slowly divulge to Nico just how serious his and Badman's situation was becoming, with Badman increasingly becoming interested in moving beyond just the marijuana business, and into selling cocaine, just as often. Though Jacob would object on several levels to this, believing that coke would only bring them more trouble than it could possibly be worth, he would still loyally follow whatever orders Batman gave him, and set up deals with the likes of Bohan Queenpin, Elizabeth Torres, among others. Meanwhile, Nico would himself become involved in a double-cross, when an old rival of his discovered his presence in Liberty City, Ray Bulgarin, who allied with the new head of the Faust and Bratva, Dmitry Raskolov, to try and take Nico out for good. Being suspicious before the meeting even took place, Nico would get assistance from Jacob when meeting Dimitri at a warehouse down by the docks and broker, and together the two would be forced to shoot their way out of the building when Dimitri and Bulgarin's men tried to betray Nico. Shot by, huh? You don't know I'm a seen star. Ah! Ah! Being a loyal friend, Jacob would vow to help Nico take down Dimitri and Bulgarin no matter what, but encourage Nico to calm down while they figured out a new game plan after both of the traitors escaped. But it wouldn't always be Nico who needed help from Jacob, as several weeks after the ambush of the docks, Jacob would need Nico's help in defusing a tense situation between himself and one of his and Batman's new cocaine dealers, Elizabeth. And then when you blood clot, I forgot to set me on a pussy wall. Yeah. Fuck you, fucking reggae idiot bitch! Rondo, you want blood clock, cause I don't even bumble clock right Stop here, you know? speaking that gibberish! Fuck bumble clock, pussy old girl, you know this? Shot in a bumble clock! Hey, yo! Hey, hey, don't hey, touch what's me. wrong? What's wrong? Jacob here. You know Jacob? Yes. Jacob tells me it wasn't him, but some people he introduced me to have ripped me off big time and put the heat on me. I know they all did. Alright, alright, alright. And my fault, you know, Rasta. And my blood well, clock, Rasta. Hey! Don't come in on my face! All right. You better hope Nico can make this right for you then. Oh, what? Oh, we got a big fucking problem, Rasta. Nico, go do this fool's job for him. Yeah, I got it. Watch me, Anna. See you later. Already having worked for Elizabeth himself, Nico would manage to keep the two from outright killing each other when Liz accused Jacob of intentionally setting her up after a large stash of cocaine was ripped off by the Angels of Death, and it would therefore be Nico's job to locate and retrieve the drugs from the Angels before it could be resold to the Spanish Lords. Nico would arrive at the deal at the old hospital on Colony Island and aggressively push his way through every gangster standing between him and the cocaine, even fleeing from the LCPD SWAT division, who also arrived shortly after he did. 
Despite the odds against him, as would become quite common for Nico, he would indeed manage to retrieve Elisabetta's coke, and would phone Jacob to meet up and hand it over, but upon arriving at Chase Point in South Bohan, both men would be in for quite the twist of fate. Jacob, what are you talking about? You know, I think you're smoking too much. Yo, me think me know the eat I come from in a king. Hey, Nico. Hey, Jacob. What are you doing here? This is no place for you, Michelle. As it happens, it is. You see, Nico, I have been working for the government. I'm afraid it's my job to watch you. And now I have to ask you for the coke. This is a joke, right? Please, please don't make this harder for me than it already is. Look, they're about to take down Elisabetta. I don't fucking believe this. Listen, I'm sorry it had to be this way, Nico. I'm really sorry. Hey, you know, you could have gone down too if you weren't so useful. You fucking bitch. Nico. Voila. You mean to say you're going to let us off just like that? Not now, Guan? Well. My employers need the help of a guy like Nico. The office is in Algonquin. I'll call you. You know, as and when we need you. The Coke, please. Shocking me for tell Elizabeth so she now get our cocky in and up. Following the reveal that Nico's girlfriend Michelle, real name Karen Daniels, had been watching Nico for her bosses at the International Affairs Agency, Jacob and Batman would begin to lie low, or at least as low as possible, with Batman's increasing paranoia and ambition to move up the ladder to bigger and bigger deals. Not much is known about what Jacob did around this time, as much of what we know about him comes from his connections to the well-documented criminal history of Nico Bellic, but he would resurface next when picked up by the agency to assist Nico in his final task for them, of taking down a Russian businessman and multi-billionaire, Edward Borodin, in a truly spectacular fashion. Jacob and Nico would pursue Borodin by helicopter across the city, before finally taking him down over the river to avoid casualties on the ground, which would defeat the purpose of their off-the-books assassination for the agency. Jacob would next be seen attending the wedding of his good friend Roman Bellic, who was marrying his now longtime girlfriend Mallory Bardas. But unfortunately for everyone involved, even a day meant to be as happy as that would be interrupted by reality, in the form of a pudgy Italian-American gangster armed with an AK-47 and seeking revenge on Nico. You fucking double-crossed immigrant shit! Get on, get on, get on. Oh, one this blood clot. Nico. Nico, come on. Oh. Somebody call an ambulance. Call a fucking ambulance! She's dead! What? Oh, shit. Shit, shit! She told me to leave it. I thought I had. I thought it was over. It's never over, Aya. Nico, you can't blame yourself. Of course I can! She's easy, dead! Easy, 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 Aya. Oh. Easy. Calm oh. down, man. Calm down. Nico, you have to get out of here. Yes, go on, man. Go. go on, man. We have to leave, man. Just leave. Get out of here. Don't go. Worry. We take care of this, man. Okay, leave. okay. As we've mentioned several times in different episodes of this series, exactly what took place at the Balak Bardas wedding and the events which followed shortly after are entirely unclear. What is clear, though, and was not in dispute by anyone, is that Jacob attempted to get Nico as far away from the scene of the crime as possible, and as quickly as he could, and helped to deal with the immediate aftermath as well as locate Nico's target in the days after the wedding. Whether Nico was going after the head of the Pegarino family, Jimmy Pegarino, or his longtime nemesis in Dmitry Raskolov, or both men, is not something we here at GTA Biographies could confirm with any degree of certainty. But it seems that either way, Jacob played an integral role in helping Nico to find and reach his targets, as well as briefly piloting a helicopter to pick him up, finishing things at Happiness Island where Jacob assured Nico that it was finally over. Hold on! Let me go alone. 
I want some personal time with Dimitri. Come on, Nico, man. Get out of here. Let's go. Come on. Wagwan. Come on. Let's go. Roman never hurt anyone. I know. I know. Let's go, man. It's over. You won. Very little is known about Jacob post-2008, or Badman for that matter. Both men would presumably continue to deal drugs out of Shotler and run their Yardie's posse without major incident. As far as we were able to confirm, Jacob, at least, was still alive as of 2013, and was still friends with Nico Bellic, presumably still living in Liberty City. As for Badman, though, nobody knows, and sadly, it is strongly suspected that he passed away sometime in 2020. Little Jacob Hughes was, for a criminal anyway, a laid-back and often calm individual, even under pressure. For the most part, anyways. Likely due in large part to both his Rastafarian religious views and his associated consumption of an intense amount of marijuana on a daily basis, Jacob was very often the most relaxed individual at any given drug deal, or gang shootout, though this certainly did not mean that he was above ever losing his temper. Jacob was also exceedingly loyal, to the point of frequently endangering his own life to help his friends, such as Badman and Nico Bellic, and wouldn't hesitate to put himself in a life-threatening situation when his friends needed his help. Jacob was also not your typical Rastafarian, at least in one key way. Most Rastafarians, according to the imbecile that we hired to do about five minutes of research, do not partake in drinking alcohol, or do so very rarely and very conservatively. Jacob, on the other hand, was not at all above getting drunk with his friends at social events, often while already intoxicated by the marijuana that he smoked regularly. In fact, beyond his use of Ieric and his heavy use of marijuana, it's not entirely clear just how much Jacob actually followed or cared about the Rastafarian religion itself, and may have just been a casual observer, since at least in theory, Rastafarians preach nonviolence, something that Jacob was not exactly known for. Tefor Davies, or Badman, on the other hand, was comparatively a lot less composed and relaxed than his younger associate. Over the course of his time in America, he would, at least according to Jacob, become increasingly paranoid due to his use of marijuana, which exceeded even Jacob's. Badman's tendency to react quickly and violently and cut ties or turn his back on just about anyone he suspected was cheating him meant that Jacob was worried that one day Badman would turn his back on even him. Between the two men, they committed numerous crimes across the city, mostly in and around Shotler and other parts of East Broker. As we mentioned at the top of this episode, Jacob was arrested at least three times while in America, as was Batman, likely both at the same time or within days or weeks of each other. Jacob would be arrested for the first time in 2001 for armed robbery, as would Batman. He would be arrested again in 2002 for burglary, while Batman was hit for sale of a controlled substance, cocaine in this case. Finally, they were both arrested again in 2006, Jacob for possession of a controlled substance, marijuana, and Batman for assault. Beyond these crimes, though, they were also responsible for numerous other crimes for which they were never, and likely never will be, charged. These include murder, criminal conspiracy, accessory murder, and evading the authorities, among many, many others. Due to pending legal action from a party we will not risk mentioning, we have decided to abstain from directly proposing specific potential crimes that these gentlemen should or could be charged with now, however, as we've done for subjects in the past. All you need to know is both of them, in the eyes of the American public at least, were very bad men. What leads so many people who arrive on the shores of this glorious nation to lead a life of crime? Is it the crippling economic conditions they live under? Perhaps the discrimination many of them still face even in this forward-thinking world, or perhaps it's just because they see no other way out. Whatever the case, I think we can all agree that America is a dangerous place. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that cloud of smoke billowing out of the car next to you is good old-fashioned American tobacco or the devil's lettuce. I'll see you next time on Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you so much for watching.